Hello, my name is Matt Stratton. I'm a developer advocate at Pulumi, and thank you for joining me on this journey from DevOps to cloud engineering. Now, I've been uh, involved, shall we say, in the DevOps movement uh, for, for some time. So I've, I've got some thoughts about it, about how did we get to where we are and where might we go next uh, throughout uh, this, this journey that we call the tech industry. So let's start by looking back, right? You know, that rear view mirror can be helpful for us to get some context about how we got to where we are today. So we're gonna set our way back machine to the year 2009. And this, uh, at Velocity, in the Velocity Conference in 2009, John Allspaugh and Paul Hammond gave this talk called 10 Deploys Per Day, Dev and Ops Cooperation at Flickr. And it blew a lot of people's minds. Uh, one of those people whose mind might have been blown or at least was watching the talk uh, was Andrew Clay Schaefer. And uh, when he tweeted about it, he said, um, using the hashtag DevOps and uh, internet uh, historians believe that this is the first use of the term DevOps, uh, which is interesting for reasons we'll talk about in just a minute about why we, we care about uh, what Andrew tweeted. But... Also what happened in 2009 were a few other things. This was really an inflection point for DevOps. Uh, Jess Humble and Dave Farley published the book Continuous Delivery, and which is still, you know, we, we talk about continuous delivery a lot. This, is, this book was, was, was seminal, and this came out in 2009. Uh, also, I now realize that my video is right over that. So uh, apologies, uh, Jez and, and David for, you know, taking that out. But another book that was published in 2009 was uh, Gary Gruber and a couple of other folks published a practical approach to large scale agile development, which was about how they were shipping firmware um, for HP LaserJet printers. And a lot of principles we think about with DevOps were encapsulated in, in this uh, Gruber book here. So these are, these are, 2009 was kind of a big year and something else happened in 2009. So at that Velocity conference, uh, Andrew uh, was so interested in this that he proposed a birds of a feather session about agile system administration. And one person came to that birds of a feather session and it wasn't Andrew. He didn't actually even show up for his own. It was uh, a fellow named Patrick Dubois. Well, Patrick and Andrew ended up syncing up later and they put together a conference in 2009 called DevOps Days Ghent. And this was an event that I think is interesting if we take a look at some of the talks that took place at DevOps Days Ghent in 2009. Uh, these sure look like uh, maybe talks that uh, we might see at uh, an event today. I mean, some of these could show up here at the, uh, at the Automation Summit even. Um, but over time, over the years, DevOps Days has grown. And the reason I bring this up and why does DevOps Days matter? Why are we talking about a conference when we're talking about a software movement is DevOps Days is a global phenomenon where local communities come together to share how they do this work. And so much of the DevOps movement comes from practitioners, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. But one of the things I think is really interesting is if we take a look over the years at how many DevOps Days events took place, and it really kind of goes through the roof. Now, 2020, we're just gonna asterisk that year a little bit because, you know, events were, were a lot more difficult uh, uh, since uh, since the era of COVID. But we really see that that hockey stick growth that any VC would love to see if they wanted to invest. Um, no, you cannot invest in DevOps days. One thing that I think is really interesting, though, is so in, in 2019, for the 10th anniversary of DevOps days, uh, we, we had another DevOps days in Ghent. And what we did was the day before the main event, we held an organizer summit where, where folks who organized DevOps days all over the world got together for a day to learn from each other about how to do these events even better. And what I think is really fun and telling is there were more people attending that organizer summit, that day zero summit, than attended the very first DevOps days in 2009 in Ghent. So things have really grown. We went from the number of people who just even came to that first event to more than that number of people running them worldwide. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, definitions are fun. Uh, everybody has a different definition, but let's get a bit of a common vocabulary of the things that I think are important so that you can kind of see where I'm coming from. So Donovan Brown at Microsoft has said that DevOps is a union of process and products 
Oh, actually, it's a union of people, process, and products. Again, good job, Matt, putting your big face over the most important word uh, to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. So I really like this definition. So thanks, Donovan, for putting those words in that order. And also, uh, Andrew, uh, who we, we talked about before, uh, I uh, a year or two ago, I, I cornered him and said, Andrew, I want you to give me a DevOps definition. He didn't want to do it, but I got him to come up with this one, which is optimizing the human experience and performance of operating software with software and humans. So you see that word human comes up a lot, just as much as software. So you might read something from that where these come in. And I really believe that so much of the ideas of DevOps come from the practitioners, and that's why I connected it back to, to DevOps days. But okay, let's let's sort of move along here. Um, but what is DevOps not? Uh, I asked this question on Twitter a, a few years ago. Uh, we wanna know what it is, but maybe we wanna know what it isn't. I, I bring this up for a few that I think are, are key because it's not that simple, right? It's not one thing. It's not just having your developers be on call. It's not just being familiar with the Phoenix project. These are all important things, but that's not everything, right? So I've been doing this, this is, a, this is a, a way of describing DevOps that is over 10 years old, but yet we continue to use it because it has value, right? And this idea of comms. Now, this is uh, an initial, right? This is an acronym. This is spelling out these ideas. The order of the letters here matters only in that it makes it a word. None is more important than another. You may like smalk. Maybe it's easier for you to remember, maybe clams. Most of us tend to sit with comms. And this stand the, the, the letters in comms stand for culture, automation, lean, measurement, and sharing. And this idea really started in 2010. Um, John Willis and Damon Edwards kind of came up with this at the first US-based DevOps days. And then we added the L with CAMs and we added the L in a little bit later to think about uh, lean. So I'm going to distill this down a little bit because what I want us to be thinking in a similar way, not saying it's the right way or whatever, but it's a common, uh, almost if it is a, you know, a, a journey map a little bit, right? Cool. Okay. So culture, what's up with that, right? This is, I love that we lead with it because it's the one that's the hardest. And uh, not going to dig too much, but when we think about culture, this is one of the things I think is super duper important to remember, right? You can't directly define or change culture of an organization or team or group of people, right? Uh, but like Lloyd Taylor says, you can change behavior, right? And behavior is your culture is defined by the behavior of the people inside of it. So this this comes up quite a bit, right? People say, well, we can't do it this way because that's against our culture. It's like, well, no, doing things, if you, you could do it that way if you wanted to, and that would actually change the culture. Um, the thing is, this is how the people work together, right? It's This is one of the biggest people parts of DevOps. When we're talking about culture, this is what we mean. But uh, oftentimes people say, hey, Maddie, what is the most important DevOps book to read? And I'll say, go read the, word, uh, go read the book Freakonomics and learn about incentives, and now you're good. So uh, because behavior is driven by incentives. And then automation. This is the one I feel like I almost don't need to tell you about. Hey, we're at the Automation Summit. You all get it, right? Um, and we tend to think about this a lot with DevOps, but it's really, really key because to move it the way we want to, we can't really do things by hand. And this, uh, I like to, again, pull this quote back from that continuous delivery book. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun how these things are still true, you know, over 10 years later. But the idea is if you're asking experts to do boring uh, repetitive but technically demanding tasks, that is one of the most certain ways to ensure that they will make a mistake short of uh, depriving them of sleep or getting them drunk, right? So what we're trying to do there is we're not getting rid of people's jobs, but we're, we're, we're shifting the focus, not only to provide extra value, but also just to get it done, done better. Right. So lean, this has been added a little more recently. I say a little more recently, it was eight or nine years ago, but these are a lot of the, the lean principles. And yes, I know we're not, you know, uh, if you've seen some of the great talks by Emily Freeman recently, she'll tell you um, we're taking manufacturing principles, but we're not making cars, we're shipping software. That said, we're not, I'm not proposing to uh, try to make your software the same way that you would build something in a factory, but there's some ideas around lean. And one of the more principal, and so lean is, has to do a lot with uh, reducing waste, right? So one of the things that's just really powerful is to think about value stream mapping. And a value stream map is something kind of like this, right? This is where we're looking at all the steps, all the things that take place to get something done. And if we would say from an idea to it being in front of a user, or as John Willis would say, from commit to cash. 
whatever that cycle might look like, um, which again, it is never, rarely <laughs> nice and clean, but just sort of look through all the things. And the reason the value stream map is really powerful and why I like it and why I point people back to lean in this way is that we often aren't thinking about this larger thing and we don't necessarily see where optimizations can exist. And if we think about things like the theory of constraints, optimizing outside of your largest bo bottleneck is actually gonna create even more problems. So, um, there's, uh, if you go to, uh, so speaking.matchstratton.com is where you can find all these slides. I've got some resources as well. I've got some, uh, we'll have some links to some great stuff about value stream mapping. Steve Prayer is one of my favorite people in this space. This is not a talk about value stream mapping other than this is what we mean when we're talking about lean in, in comms. But again, we're still talking about history, Maddie, so we're moving along, right? And then the M stands for measurement. This uh, might be metrics, this might be observability, this might be the thing, but really what you're trying to do is understand the work, right? And, and we can't see that we're moving the needle if the needle isn't defined. And then finally, the S is for sharing. And this is sharing information, this is sharing work, this is all sorts of things. You know, uh, John Vincent years ago said that DevOps means never saying that's not my job. And that doesn't mean that you should do everybody's job, but it means we're pulling together, we're sharing the load and we're sharing information. And more often than not, the information that can't be shared within an organization is a lot smaller than you think it is. So the more information we have, the better uh, equipped we are both to do, to do our job, but also to understand why we're doing the things that we're doing, right? How do they affect us all over? So this sounds pretty rad, right? Like, okay, cool, let's calm this up, right? Let's, we, we have these ideas, we've been doing stuff. Like DevOps is 10 years old, right? It's over 10 years old. We've been talking about this stuff. We've been, we have this whole movement, we've been doing it. So everything should be freaking disco awesome right now. Okay, but, but it's not, right? I mean, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but like we're still having a lot of problems and, and stuff is still not great. So, but, but how, how did that happen? We have this vision, we had this dream, we had this, this map to how we could do this better. And, and somehow we're, we're in this muck and like, here's some of the things that happen, right? There's this idea. It's all about automation. Again, I'm not throwing shade at the automation summit. That's awesome. Automation is important, but it's just part of it. It's one of the five letters. And a lot of times DevOps gets perceived as an automation story, right? You talk about people that are uh, you know, talking about DevOps tools, they're really just automation tools most of the time. And it's not just about automation, but it kind of turned into that, didn't it? Right? You know, and uh, is it just container orchestration? Can we just throw some Kubernetes at this and, and, and call it DevOps and call it good? And Kubernetes is great. And the CNCF is great. And, you know, containers and all these things, these tools and platforms are important, but like, that's not just all there is to it, right? Like, but but it, but a lot of places that was sort of it. It's like, let's just containerize this stuff and orchestrate it a bunch and cool. Kate's good, right? Helm things, is that DevOps now? Uh, this one, uh, frank thankfully kind of faded out a little bit a few years ago there, or actually more than a few years ago, there was a movement that was, or sort of spin off that was the enterprise DevOps. And the idea behind that was it's columns without the C because in the enterprise, you don't need all that empathy and huggy, touchy feely, squishy people stuff, right? You know, and as someone uh, who was a proponent of this movement was fond of saying, and I'm not going to name names, this person used to say culture is for yogurt. Thankfully, we had things like the DevOps Enterprise Summit and a lot of large enterprises are talking about how they're doing work. So this faded, but this still is a little bit, it's still like, ah, I don't wanna have to deal with those people things. I do computers, that's DevOpsy, right? And I gotta tell you something, my friends, Here's where we're at right now. DevOps is being sold to you. And as perhaps a very wise person has said, you can't buy DevOps, but I can definitely sell it to you. And the person who said that was me because I, maybe I'm trying to sell you some DevOps. Maybe I've been, been doing this for a while, but I mean it, right? People can certainly sell this to you, but you can't buy it. And this is kind of a problem. So, so along the way we had this and then we sort of had DevOps. So that was cool. And I mean, I, I, I Patrick and, and, and Andrew, you're amazing, but like DevOps is a rough word, man, because, because it wasn't really enough. Like we kind of had DevOps. We're like, okay, we get the devs and the ops together. That's cool. But like, I don't know about you, but there's more people doing stuff like in our organization. So 
is it is it DevSecOps? You've probably heard about this. This is a thing that's happening. So let's get security involved. Cool, that makes sense, right? So let's call the word DevSecOps. But but there's more than that. We also have like, what about the business? You know, the people making the money. Like we're all part of the company together. So let's get the business folks together. Biz DevOps. By the way, you're all part of the business. So this one's a crazy one. Um, what about serverless DevOps? You know, you can DevOps differently if there's servers, but maybe there's someone else's, but it's APIs. I don't know. You know, and then there's DevSec DB Ops Ops, right? Because your DB Ops might be different than your other ops and you want them involved, you know? So that's important because databases. And then, you know, ultimately we have to DevOps our DevOps because how are we going to DevOps without doing DevOps? And oh my God, this is where we end up is, but, but what? What is the right way, right? Where do we, where do we go? And here's the thing, like words are hard, man, you know? Like they mean a thing, but they might mean something else to somebody different. And so I, I, I empathize because I'm a DevOps and empathy is important that, that words words are hard. Um, don't worry, I have I have more words for you. We're gonna try to solve this with different words, but, but, but follow me along, I think we're good. I think we can do this, okay? So there's this idea around cloud engineering. And if we look at what cloud engineering means, one of these definitions is to employ standard software engineering practices, okay, and the tools across your infrastructure teams, your app dev teams, and your compliance teams. So we're, we're kind of taking these methodologies and we're applying them to everybody. That, that sounds that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Does that sound like a little bit like what we were trying to say in, about the DevOps was 10 years ago before it became, you know, like buying automation tools or whatever, um, or, you know, um, the... But I like this idea because this is how we work together. And what that kind of means in practice is, you know, again, a lot of this comes to from cloud. So some of our rules are different in a cloud world, you know, a cloud, a cloud native you would or cloud first or, you know, cloudy with a chance of, you know, Jira balls or whatever. Um, so we have these cloud resources and we're going to build our infrastructure platforms using these cloud resources. And then we deploy our application onto them and then we manage them with policies, which are kind of our day one, day two, like are things the way they're supposed to be? And that can be upper or lowercase compliance and all these ideas. So, so we think about in cloud engineering, you know, we've got like, we're thinking about how we, how we build and how we deploy and how we manage. And you notice like none of this has to do with people's job titles, right? Like a certain job title or role might fit a little bit closer to one than the other, but it's not like your SWEs are only your builders and your SREs are only your deployers and your infosecs are only your managers. You know, it's sort of how it's all together. This is tough to do in real life, I understand. Cool, so what are the, some of the things that we we mean? So when we talk about build, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now define within cloud engineering and what I'm gonna do by the way. So just so you know where we're going with this, I'm gonna talk about like, cool, we got these principles around cloud engineering, around build, deploy, and manage, but we had columns and columns was pretty dope. Okay, how do they map together? Because this is really maybe just a natural evolution. Spoiler alert for the end of the talk. Okay, so when you talk about build, this might sound like it's just about writing code, but in the build area of cloud engineering, it's about creating the services and the infrastructure that provide what our customers or constituents need. So today's world, like I said, we use these cloud resources to build applications, services, and infrastructure. These resources could be a shared service platform, giving a single consistent experience across multiple teams. Wow, that would be rad, wouldn't it? Cool, let's do it, right? Uh, the other thing is like, it's pretty cool to, like we're thinking about like the building from an infrastructure perspective, right? We wanna create reusable infrastructure components so that the application and the service delivery focus on differentiators rather than to use a cliche, reinventing the wheel, right? So reusable components provide a consistent and standard implementation and we're using our existing practices that we're sharing, right, across the way. And the other thing is what's cool is if the way we're doing this is in kind of a larger programming language rather than something bespoke just for this particular implementation, you have the whole ecosystem that applies to that. You can leverage the existing IDEs, the test frameworks and the approaches. And then using these modern infrastructure focuses on the value that our services and our platforms provide rather than being really good at wiring all this stuff together. So when we kind of think about build, right? Where does this come into play? A couple of the things that, that you know, we, we wanna think about, you know, shared service platforms. 
and the you know talk about the reusable infrastructure components and then applying the existing frameworks and tools so that's sort of a summary of some of the key ideas around build also i am realizing right now that my beautiful face is going to block some of these slides so if you want reference speaking.mattstratton.com is where you will find these slides uh to be able to to look back at them in a version that doesn't have my face plastered all over it um Cool. Okay. So how does, how does build apply to the columns model, right? When we think about these, these parts of columns, how does the build part of cloud engineering map to each of those, those areas? It could be kind of interesting. I think it is. Okay. So like, if we think about the culture piece of that, right? Uh, <laughs> live video production watch i just moved my face so that because i know it's going to block on some of these slides cool all right so the connection to culture with build is we're focusing on differentiators like i said we're doing the thing that matters to us if your company's value is you're really good at selling shoes it's not the value of being really good at creating continuous delivery pipelines right it's not that you're really good at writing your own on-call software right you're your differentiator is that special value. So if we take the cultural approach to the, to the builds, we're focusing on those differentiators. And again, it's that culture of a common development experience. So the way I'm putting this together is consistent across different functions. Doesn't mean everybody has to follow the exact same rules, but we're thinking about things in a similar way. And the more we think about things in a similar way, the easier that it is to build that empathy that's so important to DevOps culture, right? And, oh, this yes, that's just what it said, cool. Good job, past Matt, knowing what future Matt wanted to say. All right, so how does automation tie into the build pillar of, um, of cloud engineering? So we talk about the reusable components, right? So automation is so much easier when we're, we only have to do things one time. And there's all sorts of ways those components can happen because it also can provide an abstraction, right? So here's a component to do this particular part of how we do a Kate's deployment. So I don't have to know all the things. I just consume the parts that my domain experts have been able to put into place. So those reusable components, we can leverage the ecosystems around them, right? It's not the ecosystem just inside of our org, but it's a whole ecosystem around TypeScript or around Go or around these pieces and parts that we're gonna use. And again, artisanally crafted bespoke implementations, harder for people when they onboard, everything just moves slower. You are stuck within the community that is only the people of your organization that actually know that shit versus the whole wide tech world. Cool, okay, so how does lean connect to build? Okay, so focus on value, right? That's the thing we are, we are, are again, it goes, a lot of these you'll see, there's a lot of overlaps in pieces, but like we talked, all the things we talked about focusing on differentiators, that connects to lean in a lot of ways, helping us drive efficiency. Efficiency is a tricky word. We're not talking about doing lots of, reports to understand that and like measuring how many keystrokes and lines of code and stuff like that but we're, we're we're thinking about reducing waste and this also lets us focus on continuous improvement because when we have these patterns we can look at them and see are we making things better how could we make things better and then how does measurement the m in columns tie into the build piece of all of this right so consistency breeds visibility right? The more consistent we are, the more we can compare things, the more that we can see what's going on. If everything is different, how do you, how do you onion skin that? How do you overlay that? How do you see what's changed? And I don't just mean your code that changed, but just how you do everything. How did that change? Okay. And how does sharing connect back into, into the build piece? I think this again, those reusable components, that idea we're sharing this. So I created one thing and I can expose that to the rest of my organization. And we also are sharing the parts that are not our differentiator. Uh, the rising tide raises all boats, right? So knowing, for example, knowing how Netflix uh, ships software is not their that's not their competitive advantage or competitive advantage might you know have to do with recommendation uh, engines it might have to do with uh, streaming content and things like that so uh, that sharing just makes everybody better and it mostly makes you better and again learning from existing practices okay cool so that was build that's where that's one of the three and then next we have deploy so right it doesn't count until it's in production so code and infrastructure doesn't really give us any value until it's in front of customers and users. Um, 
but you need to do that in a pretty efficient and quality consistent way or else you're just sort of flailing around, right? So if your deployment process just takes way too long or requires too many manual steps, this can block us from getting new features to our customers or restoring service in, a, in an expedient way. And this part is probably one of the most key things we see out there in the world where people feel really blocked is on getting this stuff out there where it can get really cumbersome. So if we're gonna apply these software engineering practices to our deployment processes, that ensures that we ship the same way every time. So uh, it's common practice to apply continuous integration and delivery to our application software. That's, I wouldn't say it's universal, but this is not a new idea, right? We've been doing this for a while, but we can use those same principles for our infrastructure. So new and changed infrastructure resources uh, can meet our quality controls, then they're tracked, and it's understood when we're investigating that lovely, okay, what changed, right? Well, wouldn't it be great to know? Um, and the value of this is not just providing the test, it also ensures that all the steps that we require are performed every time. So every, I don't care how awesome you are at your job, you are fully capable of missing a step in a process or making an error. It happens, it's okay. I love that about you because it means you're not a robot, um, right? So we wanna have our skilled humans, that's you, focus on the areas that benefit from that human expertise and experience and not wasting your time on things that don't. So what about, you know, checklists, right? Checklists are awesome, but they're even better when a human defies them. And I want a human defies them. When a human defies a checklist, that's a whole different other problem. We're gonna talk about that some other time. But uh, when a human defines them, and then they are then run by software. So the power of a checklist is defining steps that are then repeated. And automation can express our checklists in code. So code that can be tested, reviewed, and managed. So uh, beyond that simple automation, right, you know, having a unified approach to deployment uh, for both our app code and our infrastructure changes lets us consider automation as the key part of the application. We think about infrastructure as a critical and essential component instead of something that just sort of happens on the side, right? Okay, cool. So, boom. Okay. Uh, so deploy, right? When we when we think about how deploy fits in there. Watch, sorry, I'm moving myself all around here. You are, this is, this is how you know uh, that this is... Uh, you know, a real person doing this. Cool. All right. What do we think about deploy? We're doing it the same way every time, as we said, right? The other key thing is, I mean, every time, not just because you don't feel like it, not just because it's an emergency. Like if your emergency can't handle your deployment, then your deployment is too freaking slow. Do it the same way every time. Okay. And these are quality and security checks. As, as Julian Dunn has said many times in the, in the past, he said, uh, security is just another aspect of quality. So we're testing for quality and we're testing for security all the way through. And again, like I said, automate checklists. That's really the thing. We, you know these things that you want to happen that you would do. Awesome, express them in code. And think about the infrastructure as part of the application. Okay, so if we want to deploy, how does deploy map to the ideas of comms if we continue? So uh, from a culture perspective, Again, it doesn't count until it's in production. So this is well connected to how we think about working together. And these ideas of iterative development, which goes back to like small changes that we can see what they did as that kind of moves along. And this enables these ideas around and, and things we wanna do around continuous improvement. Um, from an automation perspective, right? We have CI CD pipelines. This is not anything terribly new. Automation maps pretty well to deploy, I think. Um, we talk about these automated checks that went into there. And then again, we love checklists, so let's automate the heck out of them. Awesome, cool. How does this pad into kind of the lean ideas? That fast feedback, right? If we have these principles around deploy, that's enabling us to get quick feedback, which is helping us see value. And it's giving visibility into our supply chain in lots of different ways. Um, all the things that go into making our software and getting our software and services out there, this is giving us that visibility, which helps us with our value stream. And it helps us identify the bottlenecks. Um, from a measurement perspective, again, just visibility, right? Deploy helps us see things. And we can measure our cycle time, which is not, there's no magic number other than to understand it. So keep that in mind. Your cycle time is the one that is right for your organization. It might be different for Amazon. It might be different for the Texas Workforce Commission, right? And it's not just speed. 
um, when we talk about these deployments. And then from a sharing perspective, look, it's visibility again. It's like, just see things, man, right? Okay. And then having a common pipeline means less duplicate work. So as we optimize what a pipeline looks like, if we're able to use that in multiple places, not just across multiple software projects, but just ways we do work within our org, we're not duplicating. And everybody then can understand what changed because you don't necessarily know who's trying to help with a situation that's happening. Okay, cool. So then when we sort of think about the ideas around manage, right? So getting our services into production is a key step, but this isn't the end. Our customers are constantly using our services and applications. They, you know, we're not, we're not just done. We, we literally aren't shipping this anymore. You know, we're not saying, here you go, done, my, now your problem. This is continually running and we have to manage all these resources. And as this applies to apps and infra, and services, visibility across all of this infrastructure allows everyone on our team, regardless of their role, to have a common understanding of what is going on, okay? So you may have heard people say security is everyone's job. Great, like, sure, okay? What does that mean in the world of cloud engineering is that we consider security and compliance, whether they're regulatory policies or organizational policies, what I call uppercase or lowercase compliance, to be closely integrated into our work. If we treat our policy as code, just like treating infrastructure as code, this is a really powerful idea because when we express those policies as code rather than prose like in a Word document or a PDF, we can apply these policy checks both before and after we deploy our services and infrastructure. So when we do that, we extend that common vocabulary for collaboration, collaboration across all of our teams, no matter where they sit in the org chart. So another key piece of this managed story uh, I want you to remember is that we need controls in place to allow who can make changes and what they can change. We trust our team members to want to do the right thing but we do need guardrails and controls in place to ensure that they can do the right thing. And that means we need visibility into all the changes that occur, treating our infrastructure just like we do our source code in our version control system, such as Git, right? And also having the capability and intentionality around fine-grained access controls is critical because that helps our team members be successful because it provides reliability around our services, helps provide confidence. But the thing about guardrails in this case is they actually empower people because then they can have trust that they have a level of safety where this, where this kind of comes in. So if we go and we think about how to manage, um, what are some of the ideas around this that, that we've, we've kind of wanted to be key about? So we think about visibility, as I mentioned um, before. We think about um, security as everyone's job in, in, in the way that that means to you. We have a common vocabulary uh, across uh, different, different roles and different frameworks inside the organization and controls and process that enable and enhance. So how does this map to, um, to comms, final connection that we're drawing here? Okay, so culture. Collaboration is enabled through common code, right? Doesn't mean same programming language or anything like that, but by treating things as code, this is really pushing collaboration across the entire part. And those guardrails enable confidence, like I said, right? If I know there's a safety there, I'm gonna have better confidence and I don't have to be constantly, you know, maybe checking more my footing. And this increases this common understanding across disciplines, which is what the empathy part of DevOps and the bridges that we're talking about building all come from, okay? So the automation part of that, I like to say computers can't lie, right? And this comes into when we think about how many audits I've been a part of that are just security theater, where it boils down to, hey, Maddie, did you do, do you remember, did you do it this way? And it's not even that I'm lying, I might misremember because I think I'm good at my job. You'd be like, do you sign off that says every time you did a deployment, you followed process X2 stroke Z, and I'll be like, yeah, I totally did because otherwise I'd be really shitty at my job. Sure, yes, okay. Well, you know, the computers don't make that don't make that up, right? And uh, this gives us a trust of our process and checks. That's the other thing too. We um, these 
we can trust the process because we have checks on the process, right? We, we know that that happened because again, even think about maybe you've got, you know, a, a human that's doing the thing and you're like, okay, well, I didn't file the change control ticket the way I was supposed to, by the way, that's a whole other problem, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, but come on, you know, like Isaac, do me a solid here. I just got to get this out. And Isaac's like, okay, cool. I'll ship it. Computer's like, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. Light ain't green. You ain't going forward. Sorry, buddy. Right. Cool. And this also helps our policy go from vague to understandable. Okay. Which is important. Uh, how does lean come into this? This is how we determine the improvements for safety, right? And finally, we can express the value stream changes in code. So when we are making those changes to optimize, we're defining them through code, and then we can see where they come in, which again goes back to the measurement part. This gives us visibility into our current policy. So we actually know what it is. It's executable policy documents. And a view of our current state of compliance at any given time. We don't have to do it retroactively. We don't have to run an audit to find out we actually know and at any time. And we can also identify when policy and value collide because those are both important things, but sometimes you're at loggerheads a little bit and someone's got to make a decision. So this one, we can see when that's happening. And finally, uh, how does sharing go into this from the managed perspective? We have this, again, this shared vocabulary. We're sharing across from a compliance, a security standpoint, from an operational standpoint, from infrastructure, from an SWE standpoint. We have a common vocabulary and we can utilize success patterns um, across and then we can share the things that we learn. So really what I am um, saying to you right now to think about is we... We had this idea, this thing started over 10 years ago called DevOps. And somewhere along the way, we got a little lost. So what I want us all to do right now is let's take DevOps back, okay? And let's continue to think about how we can take these principles of cloud engineering and, and move forward as an organization, as an industry, as a community, and apply these principles and just go kick some ass and be awesome and not get burnt out. And we're gonna do that by taking DevOps back. So thank you very much for uh, your time, for taking the time. Um, I'm so excited to be part of this event. You can, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of interactivity parts of the event. Uh, I'll be around for questions. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Stratton. We can, we can fight about this some more. Uh, again, as I said, you can, if you go to speaking.mattstratton.com, you'll find the slides and, and resource links. I have a podcast called Arrest DevOps, where we talk about DevOpsy things and also a silly online game show called DevOps Party Games. So thank you again for letting me be a part of the Automation Summit.